Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Ah, reading. It's the fifth dimension. Hi, and welcome to Sundoku, the podcast for anyone with a book or ten beside the bed. I'm Michaela Andreev. And I'm Annie Hastwell. And we talk today to the author of two memoirs about Paris. I want to stay here where the trees change, where it snows, where nobody wears helmets or obeys the road rules, where killing yourself by smoking is a fact of life, where being an intermittent actor is a normal job, where being alone isn't lonely anymore. That's writer Jane Tuttle reading from her first memoir, Paris or Die, which is about the city she fell in love with, but the city that almost killed her. Mm. My Sweet Guillotine is the follow-up to that first memoir, and I'll be chatting with Jane about both books and how the second, in a way, helps her face the horror of what happened to her at the end of the first happy years in Paris. It's not just about croissants and... Frenchman. No, so she has a a nasty accident. It's quite gutsy. It's Mm. really, really interesting. I really enjoyed both these memoirs. And later we'll check out a second-hand bookshop with a very distinct brief. Only books by women published in the 20th and 21st century get a place on the shelves in this shop. So is that sexist or is that bespoke? We'll hear owner Sarah Tooth explain why this neglected area of literature needs to be given its own space. And let's go now to author Jane Tuttle. Much as she loves Paris, and I believe she's flying back there right now for a visit, she's now made her home in Queenscliff on the Victorian coast, which is a beautiful little sun-washed heritage town which boasts a famous music festival. Jane runs the bookshop there, which is where I found her a couple of weeks ago, and she explained that her passion for Paris wasn't immediate. To be honest, my first experience of Paris, I really was really miserable. I was desperately lonely. I'd run away because I'd had my heart broken by my first boyfriend and wanted to, you know, disappear into the sunset. So in Paris that first time, I definitely spent five out of the six months feeling, yeah, really quite tragically sad. But then there was a moment that I was sitting on my own one day and looked out and saw the view for myself for the first time. And it was a a small moment, but it was quite profound. And I think after that, going back to Australia, I was, I was, I was bitten by something. At that point, I didn't really know it was exactly Paris, but it was this feeling of what it was to be independent and how I didn't actually need to be with anyone else in order to have a good time, which was revelatory for, for me at that age. And then when I experienced grief, I think the first thing I wanted to do was find that feeling again, to be alone in a place where I was foreign and, and Paris was that for me. And so going back the second time was, yeah, it was about chasing that feeling. And I think that's, that Paris is a, like a human to me like a mother figure in lots of ways because 
it gave me that little gift of that moment of independence and then again and again it just kept giving me a feeling of freedom that I had never experienced before. And that comes across very well in Paris or Die. You know, you have the most amazing life in acting school. Can you talk a little bit about that extraordinary experience, something that I don't think would happen in Australia? Well, it was a very French school, that's for sure. Very European uh, school in the sense that it was physically gruelling and it approached the art of theatre from the physical body rather than any kind of methods that were more psychologically based. So, I mean, I always equated it to like the Russian ballet of theatre school. It was going in every day in your, you know, (laughs) theatre blacks and throwing your body around the room and battling it out to try and get your ideas across in a a creational theatre setting. We actually had to make our own pieces of theatre every week. So it was a a really gruelling two years, but it was exactly what I needed at the time, which was to disappear into something that would take me outside of my head and outside of my experience and a complete immersion in another language as well. And then came the accident, which begins the first book and begins the second book, or and which the second book deals with. Can you tell me what happened in that stairwell in Paris? Yeah, so I was on the way to meet a friend who lived on the second floor of an old uh, Paris building, one of those ones that you could probably picture in your head with the old lift that runs up and down the middle of the stairwell. The one that I that my friend had was a particularly old stairwell that didn't have protection around the lift cage, so the lift would move up and down quite freely. Anyway, I was in a very melancholic state, actually. I'd just broken up with the French, my fiancé, French fiancé, spent Christmas alone in the dark in a very cold little apartment and was very excited to see my friends. And so when I arrived outside their door and they weren't there, I rang up and they were just entering the building. I had this game of hide and seek with the little girl as she walked up the stairwell and leaned over the the banister basically to call out to her and was met with the descending elevator. So yes, I was I got my head caught beneath the descending elevator and the stairwell banister and by some miracle managed to pull my head free. Um but with horrific injuries, which I can see no sign of now, actually. Right. Yes, I've got a pretty sweet little scar there that has uh, slowly, as my face has grown <laughs> with age, it's slowly become less pronounced, which is nice. I was very lucky. You know, I, I did tear my face quite badly, but it, um, you know, it wasn't across my face or down my eye. You know, I was really lucky to narrow, I narrowly avoided my ear being... Mm. torn off Uh. so it was an absolutely horrendous thing to happen it seemed at the time to cut your career I suppose take your career away from you and yet you didn't really talk about it much in the first book you kind of began and ended with it but went back to your previous self what decisions did you make when you started to write my sweet guillotine what what was what was going through your head that thought you needed to tackle this To be honest, for a long time, I never thought the accident was that interesting. And probably I didn't want to talk about it, actually. Paris or Die originally didn't even have the accident in it, which is kind of crazy when I think about it now. And I think it's taken me, what, it's it's about 15 years now since the accident. And I think it's only now that I've managed to distance myself enough from it to be able to explore and express it uh, in in a slightly detached way. Detached enough that I can write about it, but not detached so much that it's not a juicy, meaty kind of exploration for myself. I think I was genuinely curious to dig deeper into what that accident was, which is what provoked me to to want to write My Sweet Guillotine. It was almost like you were talking about yourself from the outside. Now, it's clear when you read this book that you did have PTSD. And I think the thing that stands out for me particularly was the the researching that you did into all the horrible ways people could die, like a sort of obsession. Talk about yourself at that point when you were behaving oddly but probably didn't realise you were at the time. Yes, absolutely. I actually probably still have trouble distinguishing what is that post-traumatic stress and what is actually 
just me because I am I, – I guess I've always been slightly curious about the macabre life and death. Um, yeah, I've always been a little bit sort of um, – existentially challenged on that in, on that front but I um I was very interested around the time of the accident in trying I think trying to find other stories that were in some way aligned with mine and the only things I could find were deeply absurd deeply tragic are uh, very colorful examples you know Isadora Duncan being the one that I related most to who had you know in a moment of grave stupidity and exultation taken off in a car along the Riviera with her scarf flying out adieu mes amis je vais à la gloire and then having her scarf get caught in the in the wheel what a way to go you know she is but you know horrendous but so uh, caricature like and I think that yeah I was I was genuinely interested in in decapitation and the guillotine and what hap- what would happen to a body when the head was gone you know it, it's it comforted me so it's just How weird. yeah it's quite weird yeah at the time it didn't feel weird at all and even as I was writing my sweet guillotine it didn't it's only now that I probably am starting to sort of say oh yeah that was kind of <laughs> now Part of Paris, part, part of the way Paris is compared to the way Australia or America is, is they really weren't that interested in sort of seeing that you had a case with, your, with what had happened to you, even though there were clearly some huge public safety issues in why and how it happened. And in the book, you eventually get to the point that you do decide to at least try to get some legal recompense or legal recognition of what happened. So what led to that decision? Yeah, I never thought of suing the building actually it was my friendship with this character M who had worked in insurance for many years and suggested that it's kind of crazy what happened to you you know I maybe I should go back to the building and see if I think it's safe or if we should maybe you know talk to a, a lawyer and I remember thinking at the time oh wow I I I wouldn't know where to begin. But I did talk to a lawyer and the lawyer said I would be crazy to even, with the French system, just to even go there, it's just better to forget about it and move on with my life. Can you sum up why that is? Why the French system does regard things like that as not things that you should claim about? Yeah, I think the French system is a bit like the French, well, it's a reflection of the French culture, which is a lot more on personal responsibility. People choose to eat and and smoke and and do dangerous things all the time, you know, and it's your own personal responsibility. You know, Paris is is a dangerous place. All old cities like Paris are dangerous. You have to be extremely careful all the time. You're walking upstairs, you know, with holes in them and crumbling old, you know, buildings with pot plants that are sitting outside. You know, where you walk out of your well, even being in your apartment block is a is a hazard. So. Deciding to actually sue a building because of an accident like what happened to mine is an extremely unfrench thing to do. But after a young boy experienced the same accident as mine and didn't survive, his accident was exactly the same circumstances. I felt like I did need to do something, if not for my own peace of mind and, and sanity, I think, to at least acknowledge what had happened to him and maybe provide some form of comfort to his family in just knowing that it had also happened to somebody else and, you know, that it wasn't his fault. And the experience of going through that, which is what you had dreaded doing, and you'd also been not even going near the the whole area where it had happened, what was that like? It was extremely traumatic. To go back to the building, to have, to go back to the 20th arrondissement at all was was extremely traumatic. And to this day, I actually still avoid, just naturally, my body won't take me there. <laughs> Which is sad because I love the area. But um, yeah, to, and then in during the lawsuit, I had to actually go back and reenact the accident. And it was a extraordinary experience extraordinarily traumatic and you know potentially in some way psychologically healing you know because I confronted the fear it took me from something that felt like a dream into the reality 
and actually seeing what that building was and how it happened, being able to see so clearly how easily it did happen. And interesting that all the lawyers and insurance people that were lined up with you the day they made you reenact it all stood with their backs very firmly to the wall. Yes, exactly. Yes, I remember uh, my friend M at the time saying, if it's not dangerous, why is everybody glued to the wall, looking terrified as the lift descended? Mm. Yeah, it's a shocking, it was a shocking thing to see. So was it cathartic to, to have it out of the way, to have it at least recognised what had happened? Yeah, definitely. I actually, I really am glad that I did that. It was a, a, a very difficult experience, but I'm really glad that I, that I tied a certain knot around it in my psyche, I think. Now, woven through this story is a love affair that begins with cryptic crosswords. <laughs> yes. There mustn't be too many love affairs that begin like that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I, um, it, because of my incapacitation after the accident and being in, a, in this really cumbersome sort of upper body brace, to meet uh, a person who was interesting and smart, uh, there wasn't much for us to do really other than talk and watch movies and we connected over the fact that we both uh, really love this particular cryptic crossword as well. Not The cryptic itself is, you know, unusual enough or something to share with somebody. But the DA, the David Astle Friday cryptic crossword is a whole, it's a, like a little club in society. I think it's a t- tiny little secret club. And it's very rare that you meet somebody who is interested in that. And as soon as we figured that out, we really clicked. Mm, and and that, as I said, weaves through the story and now you're married to him. Yes, I am. <laughs> we run a bookshop together. Now, when you write memoir, and your memoir is so disarmingly honest on every level, reading it one feels like one completely understands what's going on in your head. How much of a challenge is that though, like to go that deep into yourself, to be that honest? Is it a challenge for the people around you as well as for you? Mm. Yeah, I, interestingly, when I was first writing Paris or Die, I really struggled with that idea. How is my family, how are people going to react? Uh, the people that I'm representing, my mother, you know, putting words to my um, mother who's died, you know, and my family having all their own feelings about how she's described. That was really terrifying. But surprisingly, on pub- publication, the response from my beloveds was far more warm and supportive than I could have ever dreamed. I'm glad that I prepared myself for the backlash. But yeah, to answer your question, I I really, I love to go into the place of where this is happening. My goal was really to try and place the reader exactly with me in the moment, which is why it's written in the present tense and in the first person, much as I experimented with every which way of telling the story. I really want you to feel that the moment and to be there on the stairwell with me. And recalling all that detail, that mm. also seems remarkable because your your life in Paris in the first book, In Paris or Die, is wild. You know, there's late nights, lots of booze, smoking. It's I can't imagine how you had any time to sit down and write a diary with the details of the day. I actually did, though. I made this pact with myself that I would write a page a day on my computer. I'd come home from theatre school every night and come home from a yeah, drunken party and I would slap out some whatever came into my head. And so by the time the two years of the theatre school were finished, I actually had a big stack of pages. And they were all, you know, just notes, rambles, dreams, a whole mess, basically. So I had a lot of raw material to work from, uh, which is the same with My Sweet Guillotine. I made a lot of notes, a lot of rambling notes about that experience as well and about that period of time. So I'm constantly drawing on the true in-the-moment notes that I'd taken and mixing them up with a bit of memory and uh, dialogue. I haven't written the dialogue down word for word, but sometimes I had. But a lot of the time it's remembering, placing myself in that scenario and thinking, what would we say? What would we have said? Oh, yeah, that's right. Something like that. Wow. It must be quite a process, though. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a complicated tapestry. It's a real weaving together of 
uh, facts from the lawsuit, um, you know, memories from that particular day, uh, descriptions. Um, it's a real, yeah, embroidering. If that accident hadn't happened, would you be a writer? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know because my career path at that at the point of the accident was acting. I just finished the Lecoq Theatre School. My dream was to go out and make theatre, to throw my body around as I had been doing for the two years with the theatre company that I'd created, with the, a group of people from the theatre school. Uh, and then that was that was cut short by the accident. So I started to write fairly much straight away because I, I had those notes and I thought, well, I want to keep making stuff. What can I do? And writing at that point was really a great option for me because it didn't involve me having to be in a physical situation with other people. And that continued. And now, you know, now that's the accidents 15 years ago, I can perform, I can move my body, I can be in that situation. But it's like the writing has sort of taken over and I, I, I well, I did a play this year as well. I sort of, I'm juggling a bit between the two. But um, yeah, the accident did give me a big gift in writing. I hadn't thought of it that way. Author Jane Tuttle, her memoirs Paris or Die and the just released My Sweet Guillotine are a love letter to the city and also a really compelling account of how the psyche deals with tragedy and pain. Both books published by Heidi Grant. And just to finish off, here's the complete version of that reading from Paris or Die that we played earlier. It's the moment when Jane knew that she'd fallen in love with a city. I want to be in... I want to stay here where the trees change, where it snows, where nobody wears helmets or obeys the road rules, where killing yourself by smoking is a fact of life, where being an intermittent actor is a normal job, where being alone isn't lonely anymore, where I can just walk and walk and look at things and come home feeling full on life like I've gorged myself just from looking, where the language sounds like velvet and water and caramel and honey and letter writing is still a normal form of communication, where checkbooks will never go out of fashion, and nor will inkwells and quills and calligraphy artists, where bookbinders and button makers and violin shapers still work away quietly in their shops, where Sundays are still Sundays and the city is calm, where some days I dress up for the city and not for anybody else, put lipstick on for her, some eyeshadow, my nicest shoes, and just walk in her. Where the completion of a task as menial as buying a stamp and sending a letter feels like a major accomplishment. Where I feel alive, more alive than ever before. You're listening to Sundoku for curious and eclectic readers everywhere. A bookshop of classics features in our classics section today. The simply named Goodwood Books is in an Adelaide suburb and it's a carefully curated collection of books written by women in the 20th and 21st centuries. Kath Keneally went along for a browse and met the owner, Sarah Tooth. So here's our latest display in the corner of a lovely three-tiered stackable bookcase. And on it we've got some beautiful first editions by women, Cold Comfort Farm, uh, Ratcliffe Hall's A Saturday Life and a beautiful book on George Eliot's. It's a little display of often underrated and underregarded first editions by 20th century women. It's definitely not the kind of bookshop where airport novels go to die. This, this is the result of your passion and possibly your partner Emma's as well. The two of us are very old friends. I am a second-hand bookshop owner. I have a, a massive old-school second-hand bookshop in the hills called Blackwood Books, but I really saw the need to do something, or well, the need and the desire to do a really highly curated but very well-stocked bookshop and slowly came to realise that, the, that this is really where my passion lay in these sort of forgotten tendrils and, and, and roots of 20th century um, women writers. And my friend Emma Coventry, who's a nurse by day, was looking for something new and exciting. So we threw caution to the wind and opened a retail store in uh, COVID. 
<laughs> well, I could live here yeah. uh, and think that I had died and gone to heaven. Shall we walk around and yeah. have a look at what the shelves yeah. tell us? Yes, let's. Let's start. We can start over here with a little favourite section of mine, which is the crime section. So we don't do violent crime and we don't obviously do crime that involves violence against women in particular, where it's graphic or those kinds of things. But what we really love is vintage crime, and I'm a massive Agatha Christie fan, so um, we've got a huge collection of those in all sorts of different formats. We've got, you know, P.D. James and uh, Marjorie Allington and Sayers and all the um, old penguins, and we've got the be- some of the beautiful old penguins on the shelves there now that you can see the green ones. So, yeah, that's one of my favourite little corners. There are much more obscure corners, though, yeah. Sarah. And we met someone just a little while ago who is a costumier who was here when I walked in and she gravitated to your fashion section. Yeah, well, she saw the fashion section. She said, oh, wonderful, but, you know, I've been a fashion historian since I was 15 and I've got every book and I know all the authors. And, you know, I'll have a look, but there won't be anything for me. Well, she was very happy <laughs> and she found three incredible books that, you know, it is a very unusual usual collection because you don't normally see these books mixed together so curated as being books by women so it's it is wonderful and did you and Emma sit down and say okay this is what we've got at home let's make the bookshop out of these or did you say here's our ideal bookshop let's see if we can get the books to make it Yes, I think a lot of it had to do, dated back to me getting Blackwood books and my daughter and I, um, my son works there too, but as a family affair, but particularly my daughter and I and she was doing, she's doing a PhD in, in feminist theory and particularly interested in the feminist archive and the sort of, again, the tendrils of c- citation of women's writing. So she really turned me on to a lot of 20th century authors, women authors that I just didn't know. So I think various things happened, Me Too happened, um, uh, there was a lot of years of reading women, you know, those kinds kind of things happened and once I was on it I just couldn't stop and discovering the things that I had missed in the 20th century because I did read a lot of men I read a lot and I read a lot of men and and you know here's a hot take there are a lot of wonderful books by men (laughs) that have been written so we started to collect and collect and collect and our house was bursting and it was like we just really wanted to share it we wanted to go this is extraordinary and so that's really where it came from and as we look around the store it doesn't have neon signs everywhere saying this is a bookstore where all you'll find is books by 20th century women which is not true anyway but how do people negotiate it and if they just walk in cold not knowing what they're coming to what's their experience it's interesting all sorts of experience I mean people get a a gist and people who walk past sort of get a get some people work it out other people don't and we will be more in the future we we will brand ourselves more of that as that but we've opened quietly without much fanfare or, or promotions so people come in and they start looking and they slowly go Hmm. what's going on? There was a man came in yesterday and came up to the counter with his books and he said, so there are only women authors in this bookshop? And I said, yeah, how long, when did you realise? He said, I did two bays of the fiction and you kind of get a feeling that there's something different. You know, you don't really know what it is when you're looking and it's sort of like, well, where are all the, like, the proper books, your actual books? And then people realise and almost exclusively are just, just fall in love with it, are just so excited about it. Do you get anyone who complains about it who thinks you're being sexist? No, it's been really surprising. We haven't. I had one person say, a woman say, well, I think it's very patronising to women, which was a very strange, strange kind of comment that I think about every day. And I, you know, and you think about the things that you may, may have said. Look, we had a man early on who said to me, there's, well, there's nothing in here for me then, and left. And that's about it. Otherwise, people go oh wow we're trying to build a very safe warm cozy inclusive space you know we're not a bookshop that's 
only for women or only about feminism, although we are both of those things, but we're a bookshop for everyone that is aiming to build this archive of work that you don't find any anywhere else. So, you know, they, we do have some airport novels. I happen to think Jackie Collins' as Hollywood Wives is, is a 20th century classic. So you will find that next to Hilary Mantel or Annie Arnaud who just won the Nobel Prize. So you'll get a wide range of genres but all treated with the equal sort of respect that we feel that women writers should have. And I guess there's some 21st century people in here too. Look, of course there are. Of course, some of some of our favourites. And as books come in, you know, people find out you're a second-hand bookshop, they come and donate their books. So we're not we, – we, we've got that range at the moment. But I think because we are curated, we will – our brand will and our, our curation will develop and we're still not 100% sure where it'll land. And we do do quite a lot of um, queer theory and those kinds of things as well. We've got quite a good theory section and um, philosophy and sociology. So, yeah, we're just, you know, basically having a lot of fun. That was Sarah Tooth, owner of Goodwood Books, with Sundoku's own Kath Keneally. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eve and I'm 78 years old and I have loved reading ever since I discovered the public library at age 11. I didn't have books as a very young child because I grew up in Dublin. We didn't have money to buy books. Sometimes we didn't have money to buy a meal. But my family moved to England, I went there and that's when I discovered the public library. And I whizzed through The Famous Five, Secret Seven, I think I moved up a little bit. I was 13, 14 at this time. Moved up a little bit to Nancy Drew. And then I discovered that historical novels, Georgette Heyer being one of them, Jean Plady, the authors, they had a little bit of sex in them. The kings and queens were always having uh, lovers. So I devoured historical novels. And then probably I, st- I read Zola. I read books that were far too old for me, but loved it. One of my favourites, that I, because I think it's so clever and original, was Catch-22, actually. I also read Under Milkwood, and his use of words I found to be absolutely brilliant. The pilot books by my bed doesn't look as clever or intellectual as they used to. I don't know whether that's because I'm going downhill fast <laughs> or I'm just too lazy. I've got Gary Disher, uh, Dervla Tiernan, um, occasionally Anne Cleves. Have you got the drift? Crime fiction. Not the American ones. I don't like them at all. I wouldn't read Lee Child or John Grisham or any of those. But the British, Shetland. I've read the whole Shetland series. And Chris Hammer, he's very good. He writes very good yarn. He's a bit wordy, but I do like him and I like his stories. And remember, if you'd like to share your reading history and reading habits, do get in touch. You can record yourself using what you just heard as a guide and send us an MP3 to sundokucast at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. It's time for us to go, but just before we do, I wanted to point to an interview you can expect in about a week. I had a great time at the AusAsia Festival in Adelaide just recently. I managed to catch up with Grace Chan. She's written a book of speculative fiction, which is a term I didn't know about until you introduced me to it, Annie, with um, Cole Haddon's Psalms for the End of the World. And we're all experts now, aren't we, yep. on speculative fiction? Yeah, the difference between that and science fiction, got it. I hadn't heard about this genre before, now I'm hearing about it everywhere. Anyway, it's a fabulous read and I can't wait to introduce you to it. I think it's another one of these novels that points to the future, to perhaps a quite a bleak future. It seems like there's a great preoccupation out there with novelists That's about it. where we're heading. A lot of millennials are writing dystopian, well, all age groups, I guess, but a lot of people are writing these dystopian books at the moment and I think there's probably very good reason for that if we take a bit of a look around at the floods and the fires and everything that we're experiencing. Let's not think about it too hard, let's just keep reading. Let's read about it, exactly. I'm Annie Hustwell, thanks for your company today on Sundoku. I'm Michaela Andreev, catch you next time.
This podcast is produced by four book addicts refusing treatment. Kath Keneally, Michaela Andreev, Sarah Martin, and me, Annie Hastwell. Our thanks to composer Quincy Grant for the music. If you want to know more about the books and authors featured in this episode, check out the show notes. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at SundokuCast. That's T-S-U-N-D-O-K-U cast. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning OzCast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. OzCast. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details.